Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Pennsylvania Health Law Project's Pittsburgh COVID-19 Virtual Town Hall Meeting. I'm Laurie Johnson-Wade, and I'm a CARES Act Outreach and Community Navigator with Pennsylvania Health Law Project. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce our moderator for this town hall meeting, and I'd like to introduce you to Tricia Ritchie. Tricia? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tricia Ritchie. I'm excited that all of you could attend today. Uh, many moons ago, I was a crime reporter at the Valley News Dispatch, and now I'm the president and founder of the Building Block of Natrona, which is a nonprofit that brings human resources to our neighborhood, Natrona. Um, our goal today is to hold this town hall uh, with community health organizations and leaders serving vulnerable populations in Allegheny County during COVID-19. As you can see, even by this meeting, things are not back to normal yet. And um, all of our nonprofits and agencies are um, being creative in serving during this time. Topics today will include COVID-19 testing, treatment, barriers, and next steps for the Pittsburgh region. But before we begin our conversation, I would like to introduce to you the Pennsylvania Health Law Project Executive Director, Laval Miller-Wilson. Laval? Thanks, Tricia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this important conversation about COVID-19 testing and treatment and barriers and really next steps. This topic is so important, um, especially now because every part of the country, um, uh, including our Pittsburgh area, is dealing with a resurgence of the virus. And maybe this was predictable, uh, at least in part because of the cold weather, which we knew was gonna come uh, hit us. Uh, and also maybe because of pandemic fatigue and people, it's just hard for folks to continue to, to stay so distant, especially with holidays approaching. Uh, but we have a great panel, really eager to hear uh, about it. Certainly uh, COVID has impacted uh, disproportionately our low income and, and marginalized communities, uh, especially black communities. Those communities have just been hardest hit by COVID. And our panelists have a lot to say about what they're seeing and what they're doing. And I really, really appreciate uh, what they bring and what they do. I do think that there are some bright spots that are ahead um, and partly now, we know that long-term care facilities like nursing homes aren't as vulnerable as they were in the spring. Uh, although I think we're still worried about other long-term care places like juvenile detention and county jails and state correctional institutes. Um, another bright spot is that we don't necessarily have the severe shortage of uh, PPE, at least not yet, um, uh, that we did in the spring. And also there is um, uh, a vaccine is around the corner. Uh, it's not gonna be here fast enough, but, uh, but we know it is, uh, it is nearing completion and not just one, but several different types. Uh, but we just have to get through the darkness uh, of what's uh, in front of us before we get to that dawn. Um, uh, and so I think our panelists have a lot to say um, about where, where we're at and where we're going. This topic fits right within PHLP's mission. We fight to help uh, low-income Pennsylvanians navigate the health uh, care landscape. We are experts in Medicaid uh, called medical assistance in Pennsylvania, and we help people get that coverage and we do a lot of work when they have that coverage, but it's not quite delivering uh, through managed care what uh, should. Uh, and we counsel and advise thousands of Pennsylvanians with Medicaid coverage about how they can maximize that physical and behavioral health care they need and deserve. Um, so I'm really eager to hear from everyone, uh, Tricia. Thanks so much for moderating. Thanks to all our panelists again. Um, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Laval. Uh, what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna introduce to you um, the, our panelists and then each panelist will have about five minutes and they'll share who they are, the organization they represent and the current COVID-19 resources and work currently being done. And then I will present each panelist um, a few questions to answer. And so for the introduction, there'll be about five minutes a piece for each panelist. And then for the questions, they'll have about approximately two minutes to answer so that we can get to you and your um, questions that you might have of the panelists. So um, 
I'd like to introduce to you John Pastoric. He is the president of the Allegheny Kiski Health Foundation. Tyra Townsend, she is the program manager at the Neighborhood Resiliency Project. Abigail Horn, Office of Community Services in the Allegheny County Department of Human Services. And Lori Johnson Wade from the Pennsylvania Health Law Project, CARES Act Outreach and Community Navigator. Okay, that's a mouthful. So <laughs> let's start with um, Lori Johnson Wade, who helped put this together. Um, and Lori, why don't you, uh, again, tell us who you are, who you represent, and your current COVID-19 resources and what you're doing. You're on mute, Lori. Thank you, Tricia. Uh, yeah, it's my great pleasure to do this uh, CARES Act work with the Pennsylvania Health Law Project as an outreach and community navigator. Uh, what uh, we were hired to do, my colleagues and I, uh, there's three of us that operate in this capacity. Uh, we have Callie Perone in Harrisburg and Callie Kennedy in Philadelphia, who uh, does a lot of work with immigrant populations. So uh, along with myself and my colleagues, we have been enlisted to ensure that low-income and marginalized Pennsylvanians have access to COVID-19 testing and treatment, and that they know how to navigate these systems. Um, part of our goal is to increase information availability about COVID-19 testing and treatment, especially for people who are on Medicaid or uninsured. Um, we ensure that Medicaid managed care organizations have an adequate COVID-19 response that meets the needs of their members. And uh, we have a goal to increase awareness about PHLP's mission and lay foundation for future work beyond our CARES Act funding. Um, some of the things that we do is gather information on COVID-19 testing and treatment uh, by reaching out to testing sites and healthcare providers. We were able to do those things and to um, create a resource on the PHLP um, website where you can go and click on the COVID link and it'll give you all the testing sites in the areas that we work. So Allegheny County has a, a very extensive list. There's videos there, there's resources there at the phlp.org website. And also you'll find those things for other regions in the state that my colleagues have um, worked on and have made available to the marginalized communities, partners, organizations that need to access this information that people need in order to access treatment testing. And, and I guess ultimately in the future um, vaccinations. Um, so there is uh, on our screen, the COVID testing site link. Um, there are other things at that site that may, may assist and be of great interest to those who serve vulnerable populations. PHLP does fabulous work. It's one of the best kept secrets in Pennsylvania. And now that we're having this um, forum, this virtual town hall, a lot more people will know about the great work that PHLP does. So um, I'm gonna ask Kayla just to go through the slides here that I have for you um, that captures um, the essence of what PHLP does. So PHLP is a nonprofit law firm that represents uh, Pennsylvanians and Pennsylvanians who need to uh, get help in keeping public health coverage and services, Medicaid. Um, they also have a helpline for clients and advocates. That number can be accessed at the website. They offer free legal services. That's right, free legal services. It's un Unbelievable. Uh, community education and training. They have a monthly email newsletter that keeps people abreast of what's going on with keeping public health coverage and services in the forefront. I would uh, highly recommend that you subscribe to that. And they do policy advocacy. 
And you'll see on this slide, there's the free helpline number 1-800-274-3258. And again, the different things that PHLP does that touches those points of the star. Uh, what we do, common examples of cases they PHLP handles, Medicaid application, denial or existing coverage ends or stops. We know that can be very hard to navigate. Um, PHLP and, uh, gives assistance with that. Healthcare services denied by Medicaid insurers. Uh, coordination of Medicare and Medicaid benefits for dual eligibles. Individuals struggling, struggling with their healthcare costs. Um, there are special projects uh, that work with victims of crime and trafficking, VOCA, excellent program. And of course, COVID-19 testing and treatment across the state. The good news is that people are helped no matter what their income level is. So that is a wonderful uh, service to the community. And again, the COVID testing sites link, you see it there. PHLP has offices in Philadelphia, Harrisburg, and Pittsburgh, but they serve the state of Pennsylvania. There's the contact information. So if you want to get in touch with the helpline, um, it's open Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 8 to 8, barring any other uh, things going on, you can email there, or the newsletter. Um, but yeah, those, that's pretty much uh, what my work is relevant to COVID-19. And of course, staying abreast of every change. And we know the changes are daily. So staying on top of that and making sure that there is a stream um, that's open for people to get that information. So thanks, Trish. Thank you, Lori. And now let's go on to um, John Pastoric. He is president of the Allegheny Kiskey Health Foundation. John. Thanks, Tricia. And I uh, want to thank you, Lori, for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, you're just a, such a great resource to the community. And, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with you these all these years that we have. So uh, I'm with the Allegheny Kiskey Health Foundation. We're kind of a unique organization. Uh, not part of any hospital or health system. We're completely independent. Uh, the unique thing about us is that every service we provide is provided free of charge to anybody that, that needs our services. So we do not discriminate uh, against anybody, including and especially uh, income levels. So um, our, our mission statement is to help improve the health, wellness, and quality of life for those who live or work in the Alakiski Valley and beyond. We, we, we do not define our territory so tightly that we can't do something outside of the, of the Alakiski Valley. Um, Trish, did you want me to go through the, the, uh, the questions or just the overview of our foundation? Um, right now, it would be great if you just talked about your current COVID-19 resources and the work currently being done within those confines. Okay. Uh, early on in, in the pandemic, uh, the first thing we did was uh, try to put together a Facebook group that provided uh, positive and accurate information as much as we could find it. Uh, one of the things, as all of us um, experienced, were people were afraid. They were they were scared. They didn't know where to go for information, where to go for help. So we created that Facebook uh, group. It's now kind of defunct because there's not a need for it. I think everybody else has stepped up and, and people are getting correct information, including with the PHLP. This is a wonderful resource for people. Um, we, during the, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, through currently, we've been making grants to uh, food banks and helping other food distribution uh, efforts, whether they are really well organized, such as Trish's in Natrona or just grassroots efforts that, that people are, are responding to. Uh, we actually helped deliver lunches to shut-ins during, during the uh, summer. Um, we, through Tyra Townsend, another great community person, uh, if we hadn't been put in touch with, with the Neighborhood Resilience Project, we never would have gotten involved with the Community Health Deputy Program. 
so thank you, Tyra. But through that, we've been doing wellness checks. Uh, right now, we're still doing about 30 to 40 phone calls a week of mostly elderly people in our, in our area, just calling them. And they're really responding well to that. They look forward to our calls. The initial purpose was just to uh, let people know that uh, there's somebody there caring, but also to see if they had symptoms and to uh, refer them to uh, get help if they had system, uh, symptoms and, and to get testing, of course. Um, we had to reorganize our community nurse program. We have a community nurse program where, again, everything we do is free. So these nurses prior to COVID would go out into homes, would go to organizations and make presentations. They would meet with individuals at our offices and help them navigate whatever uh, situation they were having with regard to health and wellness. It could be a Medicare issue. It could be a health insurance issue, it could be a transportation issue, a food issue, whatever. So because we couldn't meet in person anymore, um, we had to reinvent that, which, which we have and we continue to reinvent that. Um, one of our nurses uh, quit early on in COVID, so we're down to one nurse, but she's out in the community um, doing more than we were at the beginning. She's also available through phone calls and, and virtual um, um, media like this. Uh, and of course, joining with the Neighborhood Resilience Project, that has just been been wonderful. And I think Tyra will talk more about that. So I won't bore you with, with our part of that, but it's such a wonderful effort and organization. Um, we've been making emergency cash donations to people in need. We find that out through our networks and we, we just give them cash. Um, you know, you have to be careful with the IRS. You're not supposed to uh, be supporting individuals. So we just, we hear somebody's having a hard time. We, we get some cash to them. Uh, we were able to continue our free flu immunization clinics this fall. Uh, it looked like we were not going to be able to do that, but we did. Um, not serving a great number of people, but one of the best ones that we do is at the local food bank where people are coming in anyway to get their food. Uh, we had to change it all this year because of COVID, but we were able to, to immunize a number of people at the food bank. So, um, and we do much more, but that's a, that's a good encapsulation of what we do, Tricia. Thank you, John. And since you mentioned Tyra, we'll go to Tyra next. Tyra Townsend, she is the program manager at the Neighborhood Resiliency Project. Tyra? Well, hello, it's just an honor to be with everyone today. Uh, all of us, it really takes a village to do this great work. I uh, just wanna tell you a little bit about our organization. We are still doing the work in the community. We're just doing it a little bit differently because of COVID. Uh, ju just to share with you what our, our mission is, is uh, it's rooted in the gospel and the teachings of the Orthodox Church inspired by the civil rights movement. The mission of the Neighborhood Resilience Project is to support the transformation of neighbor, neighborhoods from trauma-affected communities to resilient, healthy, and health, healing communities through trauma-informed community development. And that's really what we do, and we've continued through this entire process. Uh, some of the services that we provide is we do have a free health center, and as a result of COVID, we resorted to doing it tele, uh, to telemedicine. We're back to doing the face-to-face -face as well, and those services are provided to individuals that do not or are unable to get health insurance. Uh, we also have a backpack feeding program in which we worked with a lot of the schools. As you know, the schools have been in lockdown, so we've had to be very creative in how we've done that. So what we're doing now is, is we're providing food to the communities or to the families directly. So, uh, you know, that's another way of, of uh, you know, as a, as a result of COVID-19. Um, COVID uh, one of the big issues, I think, are the major projects is the Community Health Deputy Initiative. And it really grew out of this pandemic. So, I mean, you know, if anything good can happen, it did happen. And it was, a, it was an opportunity for us to, I consider it kind of an underground of community servants that are out there, love and care about their community. And uh, what we do is with the Community Health Deputy Initiative is 
We are looking for, and we have found what we call opinion leaders. And these are people that know or trusted members of the community that connect with people very well. And they said, you know, I really want to do something to help others. And so what they're doing is, is they, they go into the community, they're doing wellness checks. They can do that either telephonically or uh, some of our outreach workers are doing that face to face. They're providing or connecting the people that need food and services. They're checking on the mental health and the coping abilities. As you know, social isolation is a huge problem that's come out of this whole thing with COVID. Uh, and so they're another trusted uh, voice into many homes. The most recent initiative that we're involved in is also uh, we are connected with the University of Pittsburgh and we are connecting people with the vaccine trials. Uh, currently, there's been two, the, um, the uh, Moderma study and then the AstraZeneca study is on hold, but it will soon be resuming. And so we are connecting people to get involved with those trials and we will be a part of that whole process as well. Uh, some of the other things that I think we do that, that are pretty unique is where we've hosted in partnership with uh, some other community organizations, two free health uh, flu clinics as well to make sure that people are getting their flu shots. We have a trauma response team that is still responding to homicides in the community. Uh, unfortunately, that has not stopped. Uh, we just had to go about it a little bit differently. We can only take a smaller team because of the state requirements, but we're still doing the great work that, that needs to be done. And also we're providing food and clothing assistance where necessary emergency relief to individuals. Um, our, it, just to kind of go back to the Community Health Deputy Initiative, one thing I did want to say about that is we are servicing 14 communities and we have close to 100 deputies throughout the county. So that is, uh, I'm really excited about that. And, and you know, certainly Natrona is very strong in Natrona Heights in this whole initiative. Thank you, Tyra. Uh, as I could say, as one of your community health deputies, you whip us into shape and <laughs> get, get us get us prepared to uh, you know, go out and do what we need to do. And um, now I'd like to introduce Abigail Horn. Again, she's from the Office of Community Services in the Allegheny County Department of Human Services. And I can only imagine how busy she is right now. <laughs> Abigail? Hi, thanks. First, is uh, my sound okay? I had to switch to my head. Okay, there's a, a very loud leaf blower outside, so. <laughs> um, Thank you so much for including me in this panel. It's really very exciting. Uh, I am uh, Abigail Horn, as Trisha said. I'm a deputy director for the Allegheny County Department of Human Services, or most commonly referred to as DHS. Um, DHS is the, uh, the county's department that administers all publicly funded human services to county residents. Um, in a normal year, we have a approximately or a billion dollar budget. So I'm, I'm not gonna talk through everything we do uh, normally. Uh, the, the basic categories cover prevention and early intervention for families, child protective services, uh, services for youth uh, who are transitioning to adulthood, particularly those youth who uh, were um, uh, within the foster care system. Uh, behavior health services, which covers both people with uh, mental and or substance use disorders, intellectual disability services, uh, homeless and housing programs, uh, everything from street outreach and shelters into longer term rental assistance, um, older adult protective services, older adult in-home care, um, and a whole lot of other programs around basic needs. So that's that's the general framework of what DHS does. Um, and it's really lovely that we are an integrated agency. So uh, I, I'm the deputy that oversees our community services, uh, which is uh, all, all voluntary. Uh, it includes all of the homeless and housing work, uh, as well as a lot of our work with families, our family centers, uh, subsidized childcare, um, a lot of the basic needs work. So whenever sort of a, uh, a household is in need of um, supports just to stabilize within the community. It's it's most of that falls within my 
my office and then we can connect people to more specific needs as they need it such as the behavioral health services or uh adult, you know specific services for for aging and, and whatnot um since the pandemic it has been indeed a a, a very intense time um we within DHS uh, have been spending down a, about 50 million in CARES Act funding. So uh, once again, I'm not going to go through every single thing that, that we have funded with that because I could probably take the full hour and a half. Um, and I'm going to, through the question period, really talk through some of the more specific ones that I think uh, really connect nicely with a lot of the really amazing initiatives that you've all described. Uh, I'm just going to sort of mention um, in March, when you know we all sort of uh, switched modes, uh, DHS really took a leadership role in terms of trying to get information out there. So we immediately, uh, and I mean like basically the same day that we all were sent home initially, uh, started having um, daily provider calls where we were providing information um, uh, via Teams, you know, uh, you know. Zoom by another name, um, uh, meetings where we're talking through all right, what services are open, what are closed, what are the guidelines that we're hearing, what are federal guidelines stayed, and then in many times when those didn't exist, coming up with county level guidelines for, for all of our providers. Most of our services are in fact contracted through nonprofits. Uh, there, there are some big exceptions to that. Child welfare is, is, is a county led service, but almost all of our services uh, beyond that are uh, contracted. And so we kept in very close contact with our providers. Um, initially, a big piece of that was trying to get our hands on PPE. So those uh, safety supplies, uh, cleaning supplies for all of our providers and all of the, the DHS staff. That was a big piece of where we started. Uh, we also quickly um, recognized that as everyone was talking about essential workers, that many human service workers, our frontline workers were essential workers. Uh, and we needed, we, we quickly started um, looking at hazard pay so that we could keep everyone um, still working and safe. So, th so that PPE and hazard pay uh, really started the engine going. Um, and then we segued into funding a lot of various things that I, that I can touch on, the basic categories from uh, safety within our congregate settings, it creating quarantine and isolation facilities, a lot of work on basic needs, uh, addressing digital divide as more and more things went virtual and most of the families and, and individuals we serve uh, had uh, trouble accessing uh, internet and, and computers. I touched on hazard pay for essential workers. Um, we initiated a really big initiative around uh, Black and Latinx-led organizations. Um, and we also focused on our, our, our resource family, our, our foster families, making sure that they had the resources that they needed during the pandemic to keep um, their families safe. Um, so I think that's a good, you got, you got the big picture and I can delve into some of those as we move into questions. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. So we're gonna move on to the questions that each panelist received before this meeting. There are three questions and the challenge for our panelists today <laughs> is to uh, try and summarize and answer these three questions within approximately two minutes so we can get to the questions you have. But to let you know, these were the questions that uh, were sent to the panelists. This includes what has been the greatest challenge during COVID-19 for those you serve? and how have you been able to address the challenge? What services have you found necessary to add or suspend during COVID-19? And what do you see as the greatest resource and or opportunity in serving vulnerable, vulnerable populations moving forward? So why don't we start with um, John Pastor and then we'll move around our panelists answering these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Um, I think in my opening comments, I, I um, talked enough about what we're currently doing, but um, you know, the, the greatest challenge for us during COVID-19 was keeping the organization moving, keeping it viable, uh, keeping it solvent. We, were, we didn't know what would happen with our uh, income stream. And in fact, we had to uh, cancel all three of our major fundraising events this year. So that, that was a challenge and it still is going forward, but 
uh, we were able to to keep it moving and and do some nice things. We we uh, pulled back all of our grant making and and centered it all on feeding people. We thought that was the most important thing now. So, um, and, I, and I want to emphasize again that everything we do is free. So we do not get any payment from any government organization or anyone else. It's all through donations uh, that we survive. So. Um, for the people that we serve, I think that the, the uh, greatest challenge was to keep them uh, from panicking, uh, whether it be a mental or emotional panic or a physical panic. Uh, because again, as we all know, early on, we, we weren't sure what was going on. We weren't sure if there would be hundreds of thousands die each month. Uh, so uh, we address those challenges by um, doing all the things I said in the opening. Uh, we started the Facebook group. We, we emphasized feeding people. Um, actually, we're going to give a, a ham and uh, potato giveaway uh, coming up here in, in, in a couple of weeks to people in the community. Again, it'll be free. Um, some of the services we had to suspend were our community health wellness seminar, seminars. We do about between 18 and 24 of those a year. Uh, we hold them in our conference room and we average, our average attendance at those is between 30 and 50 people. So we have people coming to that and they're on various topics. Uh, one of the more popular ones is Medicare. Another one is elder care and elder law. We have an attorney come in and talk about how to prepare either yourself or your, your loved ones for elder care. Um, uh, teen suicide prevention, we do that, um, CPR, AED training, all those things. We had to suspend those because we couldn't have people in the building. So what we're doing now is we're, we're updating our audiovisual capabilities. So soon we're going to renew those programs, but they'll be done virtually. So the attorney will come in, talk about elder law, elder care, um, and then we'll put it on a social media platform. Uh, we also had to stop, and, and Lori Johnson Wade has been so helpful with us with this program. We had to stop going into the schools prior to COVID. Uh, we were going in through through Lori and Vonzel Wade. Uh, we developed a program called Embracing Differences, and it's targeted towards every 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 child in the school. Uh, the first one we did was every seventh grader in Plum Middle School. Uh, there were 200 some, I think, Lori. And this program was to get them to realize that we all are different in, in, in any number of ways and to get people to begin to embrace those differences as opposed to push people away because of that. I think that's one of the nicest programs and Lori and Von Zell developed that for us and, and they present it. Uh, we're hoping to do another one soon, uh, but you know we had to put that on hold. We also, uh, put together our second film again with Lori and Von Zell's help. Uh, this one was called Opioid Addiction, True Confessions of Pain, Misery and Destruction. Um, what we did was uh, videotape eight and a half hours of, of drug addicts, drug dealers, prostitutes, and we just talked to them about their experiences. And we condensed that into a 25 minute film. It's pretty powerful, it's targeted toward really towards the younger children, fifth grade, sixth grade. Uh, we want to get to people before they start using. And once you start using, as all of you folks know, it's it's a whole different ball game and no film in the world, no video is going to help that. But this was a preventive. So we had to stop doing that. We had that scheduled for a number of high schools. Uh, we had to suspend our entry level firefighting program. Probably sounds pretty mundane, but that was the first one of its kind in the country where we trained Firefighters, if anybody knows anything about volunteer firefighters, we went from about 400,000 in the 70s to about 30,000 now in Pennsylvania. Not enough volunteer firefighters. So we put together this program in the local high school that we train young people to be firefighters. Uh, they get credit towards graduation and that's the key thing. Uh, other, other schools do it in the evening young people aren't coming out in the evening anymore. So, but we had to suspend that program. We already trained 200 some young people to be firefighters, but that was suspended. 
our community nurse program, I told you we had to make changes there. Uh, we have a home health equipment program for elder, elder people that can't afford, say, a lift chair or, or walkers. Uh, we would go and set that up in the home for them and, and provide it free. Uh, we had to suspend that program. So um, that's how we've changed. And that's the challenges that, that we face, as all of you face. And we just um, keep plugging away, trying to make an impact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for serving our, our AK Valley. Um, Abigail, uh, if you would uh, address these panel's questions. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the greatest challenges, um, I think uh, first it was really making sure that everyone could still access services. Uh, so a big part of that, um, you know, uh, that I mentioned briefly was making sure that all of the um, the agencies out there that were providing services as well as our own staff had access to um, the protective supplies that they needed uh, and that they had the um, the staff to do it because uh, some some folks were were, were choosing um, not to risk going out. And so we, we had to really make sure that the human services workforce was safe and bolstered and available so that uh, people could access services. Um, part of that, of course, also is that a lot of services did go virtual. And I, I, I think I'll touch on more of that later when we talk about some of the opportunities. Um, the second really big challenge, I think, is that the pandemic really laid bare um, the basic needs of a lot of the organ a lot of the individuals and families that we serve uh and so just sort of the, the added layer of the pandemic just made the significant needs around food housing utilities internet access all of those all the more obvious uh they existed before uh but the pandemic, I think, just brought it all to the forefront for everyone. And so we did develop a lot of programming that we were able to do um, because of the CARES Act funding uh, to address those basic needs. So um, one of the really big areas was developing uh, quarantine and isolation facilities. Again, as I mentioned, the, the homeless system is under my purview. We were extremely worried about individuals who were either uh, living unsheltered or uh, within the homeless shelters. Homeless shelters are congregate settings. They they don't really generally uh, allow for a lot of social distancing. Um, so we spent the first month negotiating with a whole lot of hotels and motels to try and find a space where we could safely move highly vulnerable individuals either off the streets, uh, if, if they were willing, of course, uh, as well as to decrease the density at our congregate settings, um, both homeless shelters as well as some of our other congregate settings across uh, DHS's program areas. Um, so we did that. We, we call it the Safe Haven Hotel, uh, and we use it both to move vulnerable individuals out of um, out of higher density facilities, as well as uh, anytime there is someone who um, is either diagnosed uh, with COVID or had an exposure uh, and who cannot, who does not have a safe place to um, quarantine or isolate on their own, uh, generally because they are uh, experiencing homelessness, we're, we, we are putting them into these hotel rooms. Um, in addition to that, which really focuses on individuals, we also uh, set up a facility for families. So if there are families who either um, have been exposed or have a positive and they're unable to uh, care uh, you know, for their children or so on, uh, we've created a, there are these apartments within a facility where they can come and there is staff and that they can all be um, quarantined in a safe space. And then we had a third facility that we also uh, pulled together for youth um, who most likely are in, in congregate settings um, who needed to be able to safely isolate. Uh, so we've done all of that and all three facilities have been highly successful um, and, and have been working really well. Uh, for basic needs, again, recognizing all of these um, 
uh, you know, food insecurity, everything that was coming to the forefront. We funded 21 different agencies, their existing DHS providers, uh, but we funded them to be available to anyone in the community who needed help uh, accessing public benefits. So everything from SNAP, um, uh, I think, as you guys all know, Medicaid is a little bit harder, so, so they probably didn't go into uh, all those details, but basically trying to connect people and helping them with applications um, to connect to whatever supports that they need. Um, uh, the third very large program in conjunction with the state is a rental assistance program. Um, so we bolstered that with the counties. Um, a CARES Act funding as well, so that individuals who uh, are facing eviction due to uh, loss of employment or significant loss of income during COVID could apply for rental assistance. Uh, that program is still ongoing. Uh, that's been a major undertaking. Uh, to date, we've um, assisted approximately 800 uh, renters with both backwards and forward rent um, to keep them within their housing. The last thing we want is anyone to be uh, losing their housing at this point. Um, that is still ongoing as well, at least through through the end of the year. Um, and uh, the another uh, initiative I really want to mention because I'm I, this one sort of astounds me um, because it we are a government entity and this kind of happened, uh, you know, in two or three weeks we managed to fund over. Um, uh, almost 70 different agencies to set up learning hubs. Uh, very, very end of the summer, it was, you know, if you all remember July and August, it was really unclear, are the schools gonna open? Are they not opening? What's going on? Um, sort of all on the edge of our seats, trying to figure out schools. As soon as it became clear that most schools were going to be virtually and and, and Pittsburgh Public is, is clearly our largest, we set up, um, both through our existing after school providers as well as a lot of our uh, child care providers that we fund through subsidies. Um, we created learning hubs so that uh, families that either the parents are working and they weren't going to be able to homeschool their 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 children uh, or didn't have reliable internet. Um, or simply didn't feel like they would be able to support their children in virtual learning, they are able to uh, send their children to these learning hubs. Again, a lot of hygiene, a lot of supplies, a lot of uh, support, but they've been uh, highly successful in um, not having uh, outbreaks and supporting children throughout the entire day uh, to attend their normal virtual learning with their normal school, but they're at these centers um, where they have supports. Um, that has been uh, really exciting to see. Um, and finally, we also, uh, we want, we, we, we recognize that our existing providers uh, don't always represent the smaller neighborhood-based organizations, particularly Black and Latinx-led organizations um, that can't compete for the larger government contracts, but that they were really in touch with what was going on at the neighborhood level. And so we put approximately uh, $2 million through the Pittsburgh Foundation um, to be able to directly fund those organizations that really had a finger on the pulse of the neighborhood needs. Um, so that has been ongoing too. I think that they ended up making around 70 grants as well. Um, I'll pause. Oh, and thank you. And I have to do a little housekeeping, a mistake on my part as the moderator. Um, I'm supposed to ask, have you answer at uh, one question at a time. So I'm glad you paused and we'll move on uh, to the next person, Tyra. How is your organization, what has been the greatest challenge for COVID-19 and how have you been able to address the challenge? Well, I, I think the, the greatest uh, challenge has really been providing basic needs to the people that need it given that they can't come out and, and receive the services. And so we've had to be extremely creative in how we've been able to do that. 
Uh, some of the things that we have been doing is we obviously have had to have limited operation to our facility because of the, the, re, the state mandate that only 25 people can come in to your building at one time. And so that is that is greatly curtailed a lot of our activities. But what we have learned to do is we, we, we do tiering processes. So for example, we had a, a ladies night function that was uh, funded through one of our, our grants. And we felt it was really important that people have a way of engaging and connecting during this whole process. But what we had to do was it was it was tough on the staff, but it was great for the people. We did the service twice in one day, back to back. So we did a tiering process so that we would meet the state requirements and we still were able to um, you know, achieve the, the process of what we were trying to do. So I think that's really been good. I mentioned earlier you know, with the, back, uh, the backpack feeding program, obviously with the schools being closed or, you know, or doing virtual learning, we have still needed to connect with families so that these children are, are getting the food that they need. And so we have actually been taking food to the families so that that service is continuing. Also, um, our behavioral health community organizer, he makes food drops to the, all of the senior high rises weekly so that people are still getting the, the needs met that, that are so very, very important. Uh, one of the other things that we've done even through the community health deputy initiative is not only are we connecting services for our own organization, but we are conduit for uh, for the all of the other communities as well too, so that we can get the services that might be needed in other communities. We, uh, with the community health deputy initiative, we are also connecting or have connected people with testing sites, right? Because that's certainly something that's very important. And I think it, it, even more important, free sites, because uh, some of those tests are $250. And so again, just making sure that our deputies are knowledgeable. We meet in the past, we met weekly, now we're meeting bi-monthly, knowing what all of the services are, uh, and being able to share that, you know, with the people that are most in need. Um, one of the other things that I thought was pretty exciting was we, we sponsored a Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, I guess it would, you'd say it was workshops. Uh, there were three that, you know, in response to the racial unrest, in addition to all this trauma that we've had from, from COVID, we, you know, we had all of this unrest. And so we wanted to be responsive to you know, the, the needs and the feelings of communities. We were able to convene uh, a mixed demographic of individuals to really talk through a lot of the this, uh, tensions that have been rising. We did that very creatively. Uh, we, again, the tiering process, we had people on, on different levels of floors so that we still met the 25 person uh, requirement and we also gave people the option of zoom training and we we uh, link them in with everybody who was there john was a participant in that as well so you know I, one thing i will say about uh difficulties such as the pandemic it is a great opportunity wait wait hold off hold off i i messed up so i'll get to that question in a minute okay sorry yeah, my bad my it is totally my fault and i am sorry Mea culpa. So um, let's move on to Lori. Um, and again, what is your organization um, been the greatest challenge for those you serve and how have you been able to address it? And I'd like to remind all the panelists that we're trying for each question that I give you to answer in two minutes or less because we want to get to the question and answer period for those who are attending. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Uh, the greatest challenge during COVID-19 actually created this position that I'm in right now. Uh, you know, through CARES Act funding, uh, we are able to address the challenge of making sure that people have accurate testing site and treatment resource information. So it is can be very frustrating, especially if you're not feeling well, to first of all, not be able to find the information. But then when you think you found the information to go somewhere sick and it not be a viable option for you to get a test or for you to get treatment, 
then you add on top of it if you have no insurance. Um, I had in my research uh, gone to where they had advertised free testing only to find that that was under the state of emergency that was initially declared and that that now that it had been lifted was no longer applicable, but the advertisement said different. So making sure that we are providing that PHLP has accurate information listed in our resource section on the website. Those things have all been vetted. They have all been explored by myself as a uh, community outreach navigator and by my colleagues. So I feel very confident in saying, when you go to that site, you're getting accurate information. Now, can things change? Yes, they can. And we see that every day in the media, uh, there, uh, there's something new every day surrounding COVID-19. And uh, so making sure that we're staying abreast of uh, the testing and treatment information. And I'm sure that as we know, there's new developments every day on how to best address the COVID-19 pandemic. So those, uh, I, if I had to say the greatest challenge for those we serve and how we've addressed it, I think PHLP has done a uh, stellar job in identifying those challenges and addressing them and then compiling resources that can be relied upon. So that's my input on that question. Thank you. And we're gonna go to our second question. And again, all of our organizations have several um, like nesting doll, different things that you do within your organization. So answer this in a broad based kind of way in the sense of, what services have you found necessary to add or suspend? So like, what's the big picture? What have you been able to add or what have you had to suspend due to COVID-19? And Lori, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the services that have been necessary to suspend due to COVID um, is uh, a lot of going into the office. Those are things that affect a lot of our population, um, or perhaps those folks who are in uh, service-oriented positions, they have to go to work. So some of the challenges around that are that, uh, do I tell my employer that I'm not feeling well because I'm the only source of income? And so those become big issues for a person who may not be able to get an income otherwise. Um, I think that was one of the uh, prominent things that uh, my colleague, Callie Kennedy, identified in uh, the immigrant population, that very often there's no recourse. If I don't go to work, I don't eat. And am I going to allow my family to starve or am I going to try to just get through this thing? So those are real things that affect real people. And so I would say ultimately, um, you know, making sure that there are resources available, recourse for people um, with loss of income or, or employment related challenges. Those are some of the things that we've identified. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Abigail, um, what have you guys found necessary to add or suspend in the county level due to COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, I think probably we'll all have similar answers. So uh, clearly uh, suspending was a whole lot of our in-person services. And so then really scrambling to figure out how do you still provide support groups and, uh, you know, uh, meetings with case managers and and so on. All of that, all of that stuff that used to happen in person. So much of it became became virtual. Um, on the added side, again, it was really this big focus on making sure that everyone was safe and that all of our essential workers, both uh, internal to the county as well as all of the agencies that we work with and the families that they work with had the supplies that they needed. So we've, we've added a lot of um, distribution of, of, of PPE. I have heard that, you know, we've 
almost 200,000 face masks have been distributed uh, via DHS's networks working with uh, Global Links, our partner on that. Um, these, a second piece of that is the digital divide. Uh, we, again, because of the virtual nature of so much, we wanted to make sure that all of the um, the households that that are uh, you know working with our various partners had access both to the computers that they needed and internet. So to date, we um, although we, we we you know we were competing with the entire world on getting our hands on computers. Um, we've distributed so far um, 1,039 laptops to uh, households that did not have access to them, uh, and so far we've distributed 348 personal Wi-Fi hotspots as well um, so that um, households that really needed to access internet to to survive this pandemic had that ability. We've also set up, um, made a lot of our Wi-Fi in, in, in buildings that the, the county um, operates in we're projecting out so people could access uh, internet in that way as well but but the distribution of those laptops and wi-fi has been really key um yeah I'll, I'll end that a lot a lot of supplies have been distributed um and as i mentioned also making sure that all of the workers uh who are indeed essential workers uh, on the front line of human services had the supplies and the the pay that they needed to keep on going Thank you, thank you. Um, Tyra, would you please answer the second question? Uh, yes, I think you know one thing that I would add that uh, we, we remained open through the pandemic uh, at providing services in various formats. And, and one of the, the key uh, additions was really the intensive cleaning and sanitation of the building. That, I mean, that was, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis and we're still doing that. And, and so that was an added additional piece, I think, that, uh, that added to the workload of everybody. Obviously, we want to keep people safe. We want to make sure that, that everyone is healthy. Uh, also, taking temperatures, all of those different things to make sure that people coming in the building, everyone coming in the building had to have a wellness check. Everyone's temperature was taken. Uh, questions were asked. Uh, all of those things were, were necessary. Uh, one of the other areas that we had to add was the telemedicine. We, you know, had to switch from face to face to telemedicine. We're back to doing the again. Some other things that we had to do was we moved our a way of giving food to the community to grab and go, as opposed to just coming in and and having you know breaking bread with others. Uh, we had to, you know, we had to create a different system so that people were still getting the services that they needed, but yet in the same place, making sure that everybody was safe as well. Um, I think, and, and obviously just, you know, all of the, you know, the regular programming obviously had to be suspended because we could not have the face-to-face -face until we got until the green zone, we did it on a limited basis. So it's just the, you know, the constant trying to keep connection with people and to stay engaged with others. Thank you. Thank you, Tyra. John, I know that you've answered this already. So I, just to remind people uh, in a minute or less, can you summarize again what you've um, added or suspended for COVID-19 and we'll move on to the third question. Yeah, thank you, Tricia. We just had to, to change everything we're doing as everybody has to uh, uh, do what we can more virtually than, than in person, including our, including our community nurse program, our, our uh, going out into the schools and, and providing programs there, our firefighting program. Um, but also, um, you know, we had to shut down our conference room and many organizations use the conference room free. We have smaller nonprofits that use it for training. We have uh, first responders that, that use that conference room a lot. So we had to, to stop that. And uh, just one other thing um, that Abigail reminded me, you know, we, our giveaways, you know, you give, you go to events and you give away things like packs of bandages or pens or whatever. We had to shift that from that to giving away masks and hand sanitizer. So thank you, Tricia. Thank you, thank you. And now we're gonna uh, move on to our final question before Q&A. Again, um, it's a broad based question. So what do you see as the greatest resource and or opportunity in serving vulnerable populations moving forward? Because again, until we get a vaccine, we're gonna be in this mode for a while. 
So um, Tyra, if you take the, this question first. Uh, I would say that the community health deputy program was really the greatest um, opportunity and resource that we were able to provide because that was a service that was not in place. And we will continually use that service as well too. It's wonderful to have eyes and ears out in the community and multiple communities. And we're still expanding the program, including the immigrant and refugee populations as well. So I think that uh, was, has really been the greatest opportunity. And I would say that going forward, our facility, you know, we're optimistic that we will return at some point to where people can, you know, fully come and utilize the services. So I think that's going to be a great opportunity. Food service also is, you know, we have a food desert in the Hill District. And so it's a continual challenge to make sure that people are being fed and are getting their basic needs met. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail, if you'd like to take your turn. Sure. Um, so I, I think I think the the biggest opportunity uh, that I'm hoping you know Willie really will will continue moving forward is um, the ability when it's successful to do things more remotely. I think that as mentioned, the telehealth has been. Um, very popular, the uh, being able to on uh, for the behavior health side, being able to move services. Uh, I think that um, my colleagues in that world have found that uh, they've had a real uptick in people actually showing up for appointments and making it. So I think a lot of the telehealth has been highly successful. Uh, and as long as we can make sure everyone has equal access to um, computers and, and internet, um, that that's something that would be great to be able to move forward. Um, and other examples, things that people used to have to come in, they're, they're no longer required to, where it was really sort of a nuisance given, you know, if you're relying on buses. So things like coming in to the WIC offices or the county assistance offices, if you can now, you know, if we could move forward where people could access those benefits uh, and, and get recertified over the phone <laughs> instead of having to go in person, uh, I think that would be a win-win. I'm also a big uh, proponent for work work-life balance. So I think that if employers move forward realizing that you don't have to see all of your employers at a desk every single day in the office and that in fact they can be effective um, having some uh, uh, more uh, flexible work styles I think that's a plus for society um, uh, and and one one final thing is that I think we also learned um, we really tried to do some more uh, interesting way of targeting individuals. So, for example, um, we run the for the for uh, the county the subsidized childcare uh, benefit. Um, we acknowledge that a lot, probably a lot of those families that were receiving the subsidized child care in February uh, come March might be facing other uh, needs that they hadn't in the past needed if in fact they lost their jobs during the pandemic. And so we did a targeted mailing to all of those families saying, hey, this is how you connect to rental assistance. This is how you connect to SNAP. Uh, and I think that moving forward, we may, um, find more creative ways to really target our outreach to connect people to the resources and benefits they needed recognizing well if you're accessing this one service you may very well need these other things rather than waiting for them to uh, reach out to us when they realize they are uh, in need of, of x y or z thank you um laurie if you'd like to take your turn next absolutely thank you trisha um one of the greatest opportunities that I perceive through this COVID-19 challenge is that we can really build resiliency. Um, I think it's something that's transferable to any life circumstance. So whether you're navigating uh, COVID or if you're navigating child care, if you're navigating um, food, getting food, shelter, those things. These things that we're learning through this pandemic are transferable to all arenas of life. Uh, I think it forces us to collaborate as community partners. And I think that it's more intensified as a result of this 
you have no choice. When we were doing our research for testing and treatment, we had to rely on community partners. We had to rely on reaching out to others that were doing other work that we then needed to collaborate on giving uh, accurate information to our community. So I see this as a performance improvement opportunity uh, where we collectively, uh, we've been forced to work together. And, but working together works. So I think it's, um, you know, our citizens get to be beneficiaries of that. I think this pandemic is an opportunity to teach good citizenship. So it's not just about me, but it's about my neighbor. You know, it's about my teacher. It's about my mailman. It's about everybody. And so then you have the opportunity to um, realize why it's important to wear a mask, why social distancing is critical to um, absurding this thing. And, and why washing your hands is important. Uh, Tyra spoke to the intense cleaning necessary. You know, that is a realization, um, but then having that practice to keep things clean, because I don't think we're ever gonna go back to business as usual. I think these are things that we're gonna have to be mindful of moving forward, but we're having a lot of practice at it. And what can we do with and what can we do without? So these are things that help uh, build performance improvement in infrastructure and ultimately in serving our community. Thank you, Thank you Laurie. And um, John, just briefly before we head into the Q&A again, um, what do you see as the greatest resource or opportunity for the Allegheny Kiski Health Foundation? It's, it's really all of us. It's, uh, you know, and not only through the grace of God that we're able to work together and, and rally and be in the trenches and continue doing what we're doing. And I, I've seen as all of us have, I think for the most part, the better part of, of human nature that we're helping each other, that we don't take each other for granted, whether it's family or friends or even strangers that you see on a street. I see so many more people that are that are friendly and, and, and want to help. Of course, we've seen some of the opposite, but I think the positive has been way better. And I think of the, uh, the, the tests that the Rotarians have, and I'm not a Rotarian, but, but I, I always like their four-way test that they test every project that they do. And I think we should have something akin to this and that their, their four-way test is, is it the truth? Is it fair? Uh, will it build goodwill and friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? So everything we do, if we test it through something like that, I think um, that's our opportunity going forward. I agree. Uh, collaboration is much better than competition. So um, moving forward, I'm going to do, um, I'm going to look at the questions through the Q&A. Our great tech wizard, Kayla McNally is helping me. Um, we'll see how I do. I'm a little tech challenged, so let's go. Let's jump into the questions here. If you have something, please submit it. Uh, the first question, how do individuals in need apply for help through the CARES Act? Should I be referring them to the county assistance office? Anyone want to take that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start. Um, so, no, so the county assistance office is sort of a vastly misunderstood <laughs> office. Those are not actually run by the county. Uh, those are run by, by the state um for certain uh you know benefits at the state level uh, individuals can't apply for cares act funding it's it is run through you know various services it's funding a lot of different programs as as i've described so depending upon what your need is uh, there are different ways of applying it might be through a specific um agency that that is that's running the program that has the service that you need um or it may be something run directly by the county um so it's hard to hard to answer depending upon what what the need is but it, it wouldn't be through the county assistance offices uh, i did put into the chat uh, the uh, county's website specific to COVID and you can uh, find a lot of information there. Uh, another really easy answer, and I, I can type the phone number in, but I'll say it out loud, 
um, if you're trying to connect to uh, the rental assistance uh, programs or other homeless and housing or get help with benefits uh, from the county side, probably the best point of entry would be to call the Allegheny link. And the phone number for the Allegheny link is 1-866-730-2368. And again, I'll write that into the chat. Uh, you can also, a really great resource is to call 211, which is run by United Way, but they uh, keep a really wonderful um, database of every single resource and service out there, including things related to um, CARES Act funding services. Okay, uh, thank you. And the question, I think you answered this. Where can I find a list of all the issues that would be considered for assistance through the CARE Act? Yeah, I think I think it's probably pretty yeah. much the the same answer. You can look on on the website, see if you find what you're looking for. Um, if you are looking for certain uh, benefits, uh, Allegheny Link. I'm in the middle of typing that that phone number in there. That that could be helpful and. Or, or maybe start with 211 uh, as well. I think 211 um, is a great resource for the community. Okay, um, I am scrolling through the chat. Um, Trish? Yes? I just wanna echo uh, on the same question. Sure. Um, I just wanna echo Abigail's uh, reference to Southwest 211. Um, I have use that quite a bit. I used it in my research for uh, my PHLP research for testing and uh, treatment sites. If they don't know something, they'll find out. So Southwest 211, sometimes you have to call them a few times or you may, be ha may have to be patient in being on hold. However, when they get to you and they have translations in over 150 languages, so if you speak a particular language, they will get a translator for you as well. But uh, Southwest 211 is a quick resource in terms of answering questions um, around uh, eligibility for, uh, at the Department of uh, Welfare, or County Assistance, whatever it is. So I just wanted to chime in on that as a resource. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Um, this question is specifically for Abigail. As we head into a uh, second wave and winter is approaching, are you still utilizing the hotels for highly vulnerable populations? And will you be able to increase the number of rooms as it gets colder? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, uh, we are still uh, working with our Safe Haven Hotel. Uh, it has been up and running um, this whole time and we will continue through the winter. I think as most people are aware uh, at this point, the CARES Act funding um, ends the end of uh, this calendar year, 2020, uh, but this is an incredibly critical resource. So we have been um, uh, working with both foundations and, and just thinking this through so that we will be able to continue throughout the entire winter to maintain that, that quarantine and isolation facility. Absolutely. Uh, we are also be running our normal um, winter shelter so that um, we do have additional space for anyone who's experiencing homelessness and has nowhere to go. Um, there are additional spaces um, during the winter so no, no one should have to be outside. Okay, thank you, Abigail. Um, thank you for those questions, by the way, submitted by Roxanne D'Amato and Marissa Lawal. Um, this next question is from um, Vonzel Wade. If and when a vaccine is created, how do you envision us moving forward? Or I'm sorry, if and when a vaccine is created, how do you envision the new norm? Someone could jump right on in there. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I, I think that uh, we really are going to continue uh, access of working remotely. I think people have become comfortable with it. 
And quite frankly, it's saving money for a lot of businesses. So I think people will be very happy. We'll hopefully be able to resume operation, uh, hopefully full operation in our organizations as well. But I do think that some of what we've learned through this whole process will be put in place. For example, Zoom meetings. I think that's the new norm. You know, in the past, we would travel from one place to the next. It's actually more efficient to have a Zoom meeting. So I think from an efficiency perspective, we're going to see the people working remotely and also the use of Zoom and also hopefully from uh, an operational perspective, we will be able to engage with one another and uh, get back to full employment and full operation. Okay, does anyone else want to tackle that question before I get to the last question we've received so far? Okay, so this one, um, Tyra, keep, unmute yourself. This one's for you too. Um, how are you guiding people to the vaccination trials? And what seems to be the greatest challenge uh, for engagement to get people into these trials? Well, my, my unmuted, I, I think the, the key is information. You know, there's a lot of rumors that are out there. Uh, and, and there's a lot of, you know, just a lot of untrue information. Part of our job is, and, and, and in particular, you know, when you're using community health deputies, these are people that the individuals trust to begin with. They're going to trust that source of information. So our job is to really get the correct information to everyone. Uh, it's not to force people to join the trials, it's to give them the information to get them in front of the researchers, and then they can make an informed decision. So that I think our, our biggest challenge is really fighting all of the misinformation that's out there in the media, uh, on Facebook, you know, and there, there are people that really don't even believe that COVID is real. <laughs> you know, let alone the vaccine, they don't believe it's real. You know, we, we have a second wave, unfortunately, of, of you know, individuals at higher spike levels because people have just become frustrated or for various reasons are just not adhering to social distancing. So ours is to just remain vigilant, to, to be uh, patient with individuals, to model, you know, exactly, you know, what we're expecting others to do, certainly using the face mask and also uh, the social distancing pieces and keeping people knowledgeable about what your actions, how it can affect others. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions. I understand that there might be a um, survey or poll that would be integrated at this time. Am I reading my agenda correctly or? Oh, actually, I actually, someone <laughs> privately sent me a question oh, as a follow up yeah. to Tyra, so I'll ask it. Tyra, what is the current process to participate in the trials? The, pr the current process is there. Uh, there is a, a website number, and I can I can get that information to you for which you can sign up for the trials. You can also work through your community health deputy if there is one in your community. But in essence, uh, on on the University of Pittsburgh website, there is a, a link that you can connect with that will put you directly into the trials. And then researchers will contact you from that point forward. Okay, thank you, Kayla. I'm sorry, my apologies. Any other questions? Okay, is there anything else that we need to address today before I thank everyone profusely for putting forth their talents and their efforts of what they're doing in our region to keep us healthy and safe? I would just like to say, you know, despite the, the negativity of everything that's happened with COVID, it really in many ways has connected us in a far more profound way, I find. Uh, I've met new friends, uh, new organizations, more people as a result of this pandemic. So, you know, kudos for that aspect of it. I think we're engaging more, we are committed more, we're working together as opposed to against one another because we have to. So I, I, I think there is a positive light through all, throughout all of this that can be carried forward once this is, is over. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, before we uh, at, before we end, um, I would um, like to just thank John Pastoric again from the Allegheny Kiskey Health Foundation, Tyra Townsend, Program Manager at the Neighborhood Resilience Project, 
Abigail Horn, the Office of Community Services in the Allegheny County Department of Human Services, and Lori Johnson Wade, who will speak in a moment, from the Pennsylvania Health Law Project, CARES Act Outreach and Community Navigator. As I close as moderator, I don't know if you guys realize today, but it's Mr. Rogers Cardigan Day. So if everyone would just look for the hero and not look at the circumstances and be, in, be a good neighbor, I think we're all gonna be in a good place. And with that, I thank you for allowing me to be a moderator and thank you for what you do to make this world a better place. And Lori, if you'd like to wrap up, thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you, Tricia. I just want to thank Tyra and John and Abigail and Tricia uh, for being panelists today or an, and moderator today. I wanna thank Kayla McNally for all the behind the scenes technical support. I'd like to thank Laval Miller Wilson who runs a, an extraordinary organization in Pennsylvania Health Law Project and he allows us a space to um, collectively come up with solutions that serve healthcare needs of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So uh, again, and those who attended today, uh, participants, I believe this is uh, going to be re uh, a recorded session. So hopefully this will be preserved for those who may have these questions in the future. I am so encouraged by the rich resources that Pittsburgh possesses. And you all are evidence of that, you're fruit of that. Um, we're glad that you are bringing these things to the table. And I feel better about our communities being served as a result of this experience. So um, I just wanna thank you all again, uh, be safe, be mindful.